I am Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers, and welcome back to our continuing series on the seven deadly sins here on Living Divine Mercy on EWTN. One of the most interesting, yet least understood of the seven deadly sins is sloth. Sure, sloth is captured in the image of the guy on the couch doing nothing. But did you know that the workaholic is also a slothful man? When many of us think of sloth, we probably conjure up images of an unshaven Joe six-pack lying on the sofa all weekend, not lifting a finger except to open another can of beer. <laughs> so, um, and, But we have to realize this is only one part of it. Uh, the late Jesuit great father John Harden defined sloth as sluggishness of soul or boredom because of the exertion necessary for the performance of a good work. The good work may be a corporal task, such as walking, or a mental exercise, such as writing, or even a spiritual duty, such as prayer. Americans, typically, we often we work hard, and the church has always promoted the intrinsic goodness of human work because in it, we become co-creators with God and exercise our God-given stewardship over creation. John Paul II said, through work, man not only transforms nature, adapting it to his own needs, but he also achieves fulfillment as a human being. Yet, sloth is a sin against that. It's a sin against God and not against just the time clock or productivity. So it's possible to actually work too much. Um, and in a way, that's not in keeping with our dignity as a human being either. The essence of sloth basically is a failure to fulfill one's basic duties to God whether working not enough or too much. We're lazy spiritually with God. And we can do that by not putting effort or therefore putting too much effort in the wrong areas. We have the moral obligation to take time for worship, which is why it's the third commandment to remember the Lord's day, to worship him. The man lying on the sofa may be a more popular image of sloth, but the workaholic who's on the job 24-7 and in the process neglecting God and family is just as problematic. Both are missing time with God. Both are being spiritual lazy. And as a society, many will say that, well, Father, I'm not lazy. I keep busy with a lot of things. Yes, we tend to flock to entertainment events, to sporting events and recreation activities, or even work as an escape. Certainly, these things are not bad in themselves, but excessive recourse to them reveals a flight from the depths of the human condition to this comfort of shallow pastimes. These pursuits are nothing more than diversions, right? Because they divert us from facing life that seems um, difficult. So we, we're lacking something, we, we struggle, and so we run to these diversions. But what's really lacking is just God himself. We are looking for something, but just in the wrong way. If these diversions are the only places we look, then we're having problems. Again, they are good in themselves, but if they are our only recourse to charge our batteries, for example, uh, rather than going to God and to Mass, for example, our batteries will eventually go dead and then we will fall into sloth and even depression. And at that point, we don't want to do anything. We check out. So learn how to utilize these activities in the right way, which includes God. As St. Augustine said, without allowing for leisure as a time of renewal with God, our hearts are restless. So what do we do? One good thing is to remember the commandment to keep holy the Lord's day. 
John Paul II also told us Sunday Mass is not simply another rule imposed on us by the church. Rather, it is rooted in the act of creation. Many non-Catholics uh, say that Catholics changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and that's not biblical. Well, what they don't realize is that this was the Jewish Old Testament, and we are not Jewish. We don't adhere to the Jewish Saturday Sabbath laws the same way, but rather we honor our Lord, especially on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. And Catholics didn't make the day of worship Sunday. Jesus did. He changed it. He chose to resurrect on that day. And the New Testament describes in detail how the first Christians chose Sunday as their day of worship for that reason. This is why religion is actually under the virtue of justice. Remember, justice is not an eye for an eye or just tooth for a tooth, but rather giving someone their due, what they are owed. And since God is due our worship, it is the virtue of justice to go to Mass on Sunday. Now, while there, are we obligated to tithe 10%? Catholic teaching does not say this, actually. It does say, however, that we are obligated to give what we can, so it might be more than 10% or less than 10%. In addition, many think tithing is only about money, but God asks us to tithe our time as well, to give him one day per week, the whole day of Sunday, not just part of the day. We often reduce the Lord's Day to just Sunday Mass, and even then, we seem to squawk if it lasts more than 45 minutes. It seems we can't get out of church fast enough once we've done our time. Again, we're falling into spiritual sloth. Instead, getting the Lord's Day right is the first and most important step. But don't forget, you have six other days in the week too. Keep them focused on God as well. Here is where we often fail. You know, we, when, when spiritual sloth overcomes us, we are like a football team that has lost its momentum. Sloth can lead to despair as eventually the negative momentum snowballs and we lose that will, that desire to compete. But each time we get back in the game, when we give of ourselves in sacrifice or get ourselves to pray, even in little ways like a Hail Mary when stopped in traffic, we are replacing sloth with virtues that will help us get to heaven. And it starts with getting off the couch and onto our knees. And the best virtue to do that is zeal. Zeal fires our passion uh, to a flame and enables us to be more productive and alive. Uh, remember, though, to keep even zeal in moderation. We talked about temperance a few weeks ago, and that's moderation, basically. But being overzealous is not good either. Even Christians can be overzealous, like the Crusaders. And from that, we get the word zealot which is actually a vice. A zealot is taken to be a fanatic. So we need to keep things in proper perspective. We can even become so zealous in our faith that our, we drive our own family away from the church. So again, be careful. But at the same time, don't let fear of this quell your zeal. Live your faith to the fullest. If you don't, the vice that will fill that void is sloth. We justify not doing things because we might offend someone. Well, at least that's what society tells us we'll do. But this is a danger because the absence of a virtue creates a moral vacuum that, as we said, is quickly filled by a vice like sloth. It'll come rushing in, leading to no interest in spiritual things. Zeal, as St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, though, arises from the intensity of love. When we love someone or something, we will be zealous about them. You know, the Bible tells us in John, 
zeal for thy house will consume me. So especially lacking in today's world is zeal for the truth. We have accepted the lie that life is in the womb is not life, or that marriage can be redefined, or that the Catholic Church teaching is based on hate. We need to zealously defend the truth on these matters uh, and not be afraid of what others might think. That is true love, not the lie of just telling someone what they want to hear so not as to offend them. Thus, there is no better way to enlarge our hearts than the way of zealous love. Now, speaking of zeal, let us visit my good friend, the prior of the Wyoming monks, the monks of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel, located in Wyoming, as he walks us through the day and the life of a monk. And as you will see, it is filled with zeal. Oh, it's blissful. I, I, I love it up here. This is like an untouched wilderness. It's like a rare place, you know, on the planet. My name is Father Daniel Mary. I am the prior of the Carmelite monks of Wyoming. In the year 2001, God gave me a very strong calling to found a monastery in the pristine wilderness of Wyoming, a monastery dedicated to Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome to the monastery of Our Lady of the New Mount Carmel. In the near future, the monks here at the New Mount Carmel Monastery are going to become cloistered. So this is a golden opportunity for us to bring you in to peer into the life of a monk. Come on in and follow me. The preeminent mark of the Carmelite monk of Wyoming is that we are called to a profound, deep filial union with the Blessed Virgin. We believe that that's where the real grace and the real power for the priesthood to be renewed and rejuvenated with grace, that it's going to come from the cloistered contemplative life generating that grace. That's what a monk does. The Carmelite monks begin their day in the middle of the night. At about 11.40, the monks are woken up by a bell and the monk gets up and he immediately prostrates on the floor to make his morning offering. Then he prepares himself to go to choir to begin the midnight office of matins and lauds. But in the middle of the night, the monk is already purchasing grace for souls all over the world. Now after this office, which takes about an hour and 20 minutes, the monk returns to his hermitage, yes, to go to bed again. At 5.40, the choir monks wake up. Once assembled again in chapel, the bells are rung for Angelus. After the Angelus, the brothers prepare for the Office of Prime. Now, during the Office of Prime, which is a unique office, the monks also have the Martyrology read, which is the readings about the saint of the next day. After Prime, the lay brothers go to their chapel for their low mass. The choir monks begin their mental prayer for one hour. And at 725, they assemble in chapel for the Office of Terce. The High Mass follows Terce. We have beautiful Gregorian chant being sung, and everything is done according to the Carmelite Rite and all the rubrics of the Carmelite Rite, which dates back to the 1100s. After the solemn High Mass, the monks go to the refectory for breakfast. And during this season, we stand as one of the Carmelite penitential practices. After breakfast, the monks go to their various workplaces. As you can see, the monastery here at the New Mount Carmel is under construction. This work is being done solely by the monks. All of the stone carving, all of the masonry work, even woodwork, 
One of the industries that has served us well is Mystic Monk Coffee. The vision from the very beginning was, you know, Bishop Ricken told us we needed an industry as monks to support ourselves. One of the brothers came to Father Pryor and was like, Father Pryor, I think, I think roasting coffee could actually be really profitable and just really good for our monasticism. So we started off with a very small roaster and it was in a very small shop. This was right at the beginning of e-commerce, so we figured we need to sell it online. Our first many years, I guess, was just kind of um, repeat customers and also word of mouth. Someone tried it, oh, that's great, I'll have some more. So that, that was kind of how it, it kept snowballing. I really feel that, that Our Lady, she really had this in mind because she wanted, she wanted this Gothic monastery to be here for just countless young men um, to be able to come and give, give their lives to gods. You can't have a Gothic monastery without Gothic carving, so we set this place up. Back when we first started looking at building a Gothic monastery, we went to several companies to see if someone could carve the stone for us. And when we got the pricing, we uh, almost had a heart attack. And we knew there was only one option, and that was to do it ourselves. Before I started carving stone, I was working Mystic Monk Coffee. I was actually one of the coffee monks that would roast coffee, and so came in with completely no background and no understanding. We had a lot of help from the machine manufacturers, but in the end, there weren't too many people that actually did this kind of carving, and there still aren't today. So a lot of it, we kind of just had to learn ourselves. So here we see our wire saw. So this is basically the, the machine that processes the raw blocks from the quarry, and it'll do a number of things from simply slicing off the rough material, or to right now, as you can see, it's actually profiling. So it's cutting intricate pieces and shapes out of the stone that will then either go directly in the wall or will take it further in the system and pr to process further into the fine detail. This is where we actually carve the fine detail into our pieces, into all the stones. So it actually starts off, one of the monks will design in a computer the actual 3D model, all of the leaves and vines and everything. And then he'll hand off that 3D model to another monk who will actually program all the coordinates that you see running here on this screen, program everything for how the machine will come in and put in all those fine details into each stone. Italy is still the leader in stone manufacturing, stone carving, and so these machines actually came straight from Italy. So here we are up at Hermit Valley. We're at the um, pad that we're building for a hermitage for a hermit that's going to be an anchorite. So he will live completely in solitude on a, on a 15 to 20 acre plot up here in the mountains. It will be walled off. It'll be like an enclosure within the enclosure. As far as a, a hermit or a monk, this is the highest uh, uh, vocation that you could aspire to. It takes a very special kind of person to do this. And you, he's not alone, okay? Here's the reality. When you go into this kind of anchoritic solitude, you become united with every soul throughout the world. And he's drawing that grace, bringing it down, you know, through his life of, of penance, through the vows, through fasting, through continual prayer. And that does make him in, united with every soul on the planet. The monks end their work at 1115 to prepare for the office of sex. After this office, the bells ring again for the Angelus at 12 noon. Then the monks process down to the refectory. We have readings from the sacred scripture, the lives of the saints, and the monks eat in silence with their hoods up during this season. After lunch, the monks process back to the chapel for the afternoon prayer called Known. After Known, the monks immediately go to recreation, which can be inside as a community where we gather in a circle and tell stories. You know, maybe we should put a sign up that says, you know, be aware, <laughs> high voltage. <laughs> and there's a lot of laughing, fun-heartedness. <laughs> high voltage. <laughs> or we go out and we might play a game of football, if they're young monks, of course. After recreation, some of the monks go back to work while the other younger monks attend class. Lexio Quinta, page 16. 
Why don't we do this? Let's just dive right in and start translating. Uh, in the middle of the work period, about three o'clock, a bell is usually rung in the various industries or places of the monastery where the monks in that place will come together and do the chaplet of divine mercy with their hands extended in the form of a cross. Work ends at about 4.30 and monks then begin to prepare for the office of Vespers, which is chanted in full Gregorian chant from our Kerales. After Vespers, monks go to their hermitage to do mental prayer. And they use this time to really intercede for the world and to grow closer in their union with God and the Blessed Virgin Mary. After mental prayer, the monks go to the chapel for the 6.30 Angelus. After the Angelus, they process down to the refectory where we have supper. And again, during the meal, there is reading from the lives of the saints or the Carmelite writings of our great saints like St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross. After the rosary, we have Compline, which again is in full Gregorian chant. This then is the last office of the day, known as night prayer. And the monks begin the great silence after Compline, and they go to their hermitages to retire to solitude. When this monastery is completed, we believe that this holy place up here at the New Mount Carmel will generate grace for the whole world through the intercession of our Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel. Yeah, it's all my vision over time. I, you know, I never dreamed we would be doing all the things we're doing. I think it does take someone, you know, uh, pretty, you know, gutsy maybe, you could say. But that's my quality, I guess, that I have is that I'm not afraid of much of anything. Well, thank you again to my good friend, Father Daniel Mary. We're very appreciative because these Wyoming monks opened their doors, allowing myself and our camera crew from EWTN in behind the scenes of their cloister. Now it has been closed and we'll never have another opportunity to see the day in the life of a monk like we just did in this piece. So God bless you and all of the monks for what you do in prayer for the church. Now, let us go back to Sloth and hear a little bit more from Father Andy Davey. Hi, my name is Father Andy Davey, and I am a Marian of the Immaculate Conception priest, and this is Ask a Marian. Monica asks, if I come in late to work, am I stealing from the company, and do I need to go to confession? How does the church define sloth? Well, Monica, that is a really good question. First of all, the church defines sloth as a kind of laziness, um, and, and in many ways, like a spiritual kind of laziness of, in a sense, not doing what, what we're being called to do. Um, we've been given our mind, our heart, our talents, our bodies, um, the, uh, our, our, our ability to be able to um, be able to create beautiful things in this world, to be able to help others. And sloth is something that gets in the way of that. Sloth is something that slows us down and just has us sit versus serve. Um, so a way of maybe thinking about this question is if I come in late to work, it depends on what's the reason for coming in late to work. If it's something that I'm sick, if it's something that someone in my family is hurting and I'm reaching out in an emergency thing, I, I do owe it to my company to be able to say this is the reason for it. But if it's something where I'm just getting into a habit of getting in late to work, it's kind of like getting into a habit of you know, coming in late to church or something like that, um, then it, we have to kind of look at the intention and to see am I not being that better version of myself or am I in a sense giving this space even though it's taking away from the company and from what they've been calling me to do. So there's a balance there, but it is important if it is something where I'm recognizing in my own life that I'm, I'm taking advantage of my company, 
um, then that is probably something I need to go to confession for. If it's something where there's an emergency, there's something where um, I just need to keep growing in, in my own habits to be better at that, um, that's something, you know, we can always bring to prayer and say, Lord, just help me to be able to find that, 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 that deeper, the deeper drive within my heart to be able to help others, to lift others up, and to really see that my work is also something that I can offer up to you, Lord, in prayer. Um, so once again, thanks for asking that question, Monica, and thanks for asking a Marian. For myself, I ask, Lord, transform me completely into yourself. Maintain in me a holy zeal for your glory. Give me the grace and spiritual strength to do your holy will in all things. Our life is truly apostolic. I cannot imagine a religious living in one of our houses, that is, in our community, and not having an apostolic spirit. Zeal for the salvation of souls should burn in our hearts. Know, my daughter, that the ardor of your heart is pleasing to me, and just as you desire ardently to become united with me in Holy Communion, so too do I desire to give myself wholly to you, and as a reward for your zeal, rest on my heart. Well, thank you everybody for being with us on this completion of our series on the seven deadly sins. And if you missed any of the episodes, you can see them on our website, livingdivinemercy.org. Org. Well, again, please join us next week as we return with a special episode on Ash Wednesday as we begin the season of Lent. And until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <music>